Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning. Good to have Miss Cleta back with us. Amen. Let's stand, sing chorus, open our eyes. It's not Chris's fault. We won't blame him. We blame everything on Carla. Carla did it. Amen. Hymn number 473, Victory in Jesus.
morning. morning. Quite a few announcements today. You might want to grab a pencil and a paper. Um, There will be no 5 o'clock service today. We will only have 6 o'clock service, and there will be a special guest speaker with us, so please come back at 6 o'clock tonight to enjoy that. The ladies' Bible study will be Tuesday at 6 p.m. for session 3 of our Bible study. It's going really great. If you have not joined so far, you are not late. Jump in at any time. Next Sunday, we'll have another cottage prayer meeting and a cookout at Miss June Sailor's house again on at 5 o'clock next Sunday night. Also, it is Pastor Appreciation Month in October, so we are planning on doing a money tree for um, Brother Jeff and Miss Judy Kaufman. And if you have any contributions you want to make to that, please get them to Adina. Um, before next Sunday, if you can, before next Sunday at five. Um, I think that that is all. Oh, the ladies, Adina needs to meet with the ladies right after the morning service today for a short meeting. But I think that's all that I have. Choir practice today at 430, if you're a member of the choir. Hymn number 530. Save, save.
number 385, Near the Cross. sing a uh, familiar song probably to everyone this morning there is a river <clears throat> uh, this version of the song is extremely slow so that's not because I'm old but <clears throat> it's just it's just the version of the song but if you will really just uh, the last time I sang it I thought man this song is just too slow it just kind of drags on but if you really concentrate on the words, and maybe that's the reason the writer wrote it so slow, is to just take it all in. There is a river that never shall run dry. <clears throat> From heaven, it was like a rushing wind. It filled their hearts with singing, and it Oh, 
that gave this promise. He said the Spirit will descend. And from your inner
aren't you glad that there is a river <laughs> like that? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. I thought maybe since Jeff was gone, nobody would come. But <laughs> Turn your Bible, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Glad to see everybody. Everybody looks so chipper this morning and ready to go. Some new people here with curly hair and some who <laughs> we don't recognize. Good to see Mark and Marge here this morning. Glad you're back. Uh, glad to see Miss, uh, where'd she go? Oh, <laughs> Amen. Glad you. I thought you'd gone. <laughs> Amen. Okay, in Romans chapter 5, look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned. What I want to talk to you about this morning is some mistakes in the Bible. Some mistakes in the Bible. And I know some people think, oh no, no, wait a minute, there's no mistakes in the Word of God. Well, yes there is. I found five and I want to bring these to you. And I think after you see them, you'll agree with me. So if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I wanted to start off with, with Romans chapter 5 because that shows you right there that everybody is a sinner. Everybody is a sinner. Nobody is excluded. Everybody is a sinner. We were born sinners. And we will die sinners. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have of being in your house today. And I pray, Lord, as the word is spoken, that our hearts will listen and our minds will be clear to hear the word of God. Father, thank you for everything that you've done. Father, just rebuke Satan and anything that he would try to do to hinder the word today. Father, we love you. We just want to serve you. We just ask that you would take us and use us and help us, Lord, to be vessels fit for your service. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each and every one. And when we leave this building, we'll say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> and look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God does know the day you eat thereof, though your eyes be open, you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave to her husband, he did uh, with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Well, there's only one thing here that he told was the truth. He said, your eyes will be open. And they were open, but not like they thought they would be. Here, Adam and Eve lived in a perfect place. There was no sin. They had perfect fellowship with God. And you would think it would always be that way. But no, Eve had to listen to the Satan. She was deceived, but Adam chose to sin. Now I want you to look back at Genesis chapter 2. And look at verse 15. <clears throat> and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now these words, to dress it and to keep it, mean to keep, means to guard and protect. But guard and protect from what? Guard and protect from whom? I mean, what was they to guard against? It was only Adam and Eve. What was they to guard against? They had a warning. 
they had a warning. Adam, be alert. Be alert. That's what God was telling him. Be alert, Adam. Something's going to happen. You be alert. Well, Adam was gone and Eve was alone. And what happened? The serpent come to her. Now, he wasn't a snake when he come to her. No, that wasn't what he was. He was something beautiful. It was some creature that you would have loved to sit down and talk to. That's what I think. The, the, he became a snake when God cursed him. Well, they had a warning. God told him, said, the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Now, did they die? Yeah, they died. Not physically, but spiritually. They died. Adam had a warning, but they weren't obedient to God. Did they die? Yes, sir, they died spiritually. When God came to the garden, what was the first thing that they had after they sinned? Was fear. Was fear. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence uh, of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And God called to Adam. He says, where art thou? Adam, where are you? Adam says, I was afraid. I hid. God says, Adam, who told you that you was naked? He said, the serpent beguiled me. Well, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and it goes on down the line. God wound up and expelled them from Eden. Their sin plunged humanity into a world of sin, sorrow, and death. Adam and Eve were created to live forever, but sin stopped that. But aren't you glad that God made a way that we can still live forever? Look at verse 15 of chapter 3. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Right here was promised a Messiah that would come. A Messiah that would come to save humanity. Well, <clears throat> God made a way for us to live through ever through that uh, Messiah. They suffered the consequences for the, of the sin for the rest of their lives. They had many sorrows because of their sin. I wonder what they must have thought when they saw Abel laying in the pool of blood with his, with his head crushed in because of what Cain had done to him. They saw that bloody body of, of Abel and their hearts must have been broken. Listen, folks, you cannot commit a sin without hurting someone else. You always reap what you sow. Every time you commit a sin, you're going to reap that sin because God is going to make sure that it comes out. You cannot hide sin. Sooner or later, it will come out. God will see to that because He's not going to let you get away with it. Okay, now, number two, the, the next mistake we find in the Bible, turn to Numbers, to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. <clears throat> when you get there, look at verse 7. Numbers 20 and verse 7. And the Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron and thy brethren. Speak ye unto the rock before the eyes, and it shall give forth water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, and thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said unto them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with the rod and smote the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast drank also. God told him to speak to the rock. He was disobedient. Do you realize what he did when he hit that rock twice? The rock is a type of Christ, and that's like crucifying Jesus two times. And folks, once was enough. He entered into the Holy of Holies one time, and he never had to be repeated again. And so they had he, Moses paid a dear price. God called <coughs> him to be the leader of Israel out of Egypt. All the plagues that Moses performed in Egypt was against the God that Egypt had. 
the God against flies, the God against frogs, the God against darkness, the God against all these things. And God was bringing all these plagues and He's using Moses to bring these plagues into Egypt. And God was saying to Pharaoh, where is your God now? Why doesn't He stop this flies coming on? Why doesn't He stop all these frogs? Why doesn't He do this? Why doesn't He do that? Because He wasn't powerful enough. That's why God is actually saying to God, uh, to Pharaoh, where is your God now? After they left Egypt, Moses led them through the wilderness performing miracles for them. All kinds of miracles he performed. And God told him in Exodus chapter 17, Moses, you hit the rock. He hit that rock there and water gushed out abundantly. But here he tells him to, to speak to the rock. And yet he hit the rock again. <clears throat> I think because of their complaining, Moses got mad and said, must we fetch you water out of this rock? What God, what Moses was doing was taking the glory away from God to himself. He got tired of all their complaining because that's all they did was complain, moaned and groaned because things weren't like they wanted them to be. And so Moses got so fed up, he got mad and he says, look, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And he hit that rock twice and water gushed out abundantly. But when he did, Moses realized, oops, I made a mistake. I made a real mistake here. And God told him, he says, And the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. And Moses never got to go into the promised land like Israel did. Listen, folks. You reap what you sow. And Moses sowed sin, and so Moses reaped his sin for the rest of his natural life. Now look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at me. I'm reaping sin. Not because I committed sin, but because sin come into the world. And because sin come into the world, we have sickness, we have death, we have crippled bodies, we have all kinds of diseases, we have all this because of sin. The one word, sin. You reap what you sow, and boy, Moses reaped what he sowed. Second mistake. Now let's look at the third mistake. Turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And look at verse 1. Very familiar story. And it came to pass that the year was expired, the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him. And all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David rose off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came unto him, and he lay with her, and she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. The woman conceived and sent to David and said, I am with child. David sinned. This great king fell for the trap that Satan laid out. Now, folks, I want to tell you, Bathsheba wasn't innocent in this matter. Let me, let me, let me give you a picture of what I think kind of happened. Bathsheba was bathing on top of her roof. David's castle was up top of that. And so she knew that King David would come out there every once in a while and walk in the evening. So she thought, well, I'll just kind of strip down here and take me a little bath. And she'd look up there and see David. So she just kind of paraded around naked as a jaybird, and David looked down there. The one look wasn't wrong, but when he took that second look, then sin come in. David, who wrote so many beautiful psalms, fell for the trap. Who was a giant killer, fell for the trap. Who won so many victories, fell for the trap. David, who come riding into the city on horse, and the women cried out, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now David was living a lie. He was trying to hide his sin. God won't let you hide your sin, neighbor. His sin come out. 
Don't you know that rumors were going around in the castle? Hey, what about David? What's going on with David? His countenance has changed. Sin has a way of changing your countenance, folks. You try to hide it, but it's not going to be hid. That's impossible. If David would have kept his mind on God, he wouldn't be in this mess. When our thoughts lean towards worldly things, we begin, <clears throat> we begin a downward slope to a sad destruction. Sin always costs you more than what you can afford. God sends Nathan the prophet to talk to David. Look at chapter 12. Nathan the prophet comes in and tells him the parable about the rich man that had, <coughs> that had company come in. And so he had all kinds of flocks and everything, but he took the poor man's sheep and, and slaughtered it to feed his company. And David's anger was roused and he said, that man is going to pay fourfold for what he did. And Nathan looks at David and he said, David, thou art the man that I'm talking about. You're the one that's committed sin. You're the one that God has sent me to talk to. You're the one that's going to pay the price. And the sword never left the house of David. He paid for his sin for the rest of his natural life. Remember, sin costs you more than you can pay. But aren't you glad that Jesus paid our sin debt that day on Calvary? Before David realized it, he had a mountain of sin added to his sin debt already. Only the blood that flowed from the body of Jesus can wash away our sin. And it flowed abundantly that day on Calvary. And it washed away the sin of David. It washed away my sin. It washes away the sin of all those in the future that come to him. And folks, it'll wash away your sin if you're not saved forever and ever. The third mistake. David paid a dear price. The baby that was conceived died. His son uh, turned against him. All kinds of things happened to David because of that one sin. That one night of sin, it cost him dearly. Let's look at the fourth mistake. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. The fourth mistake. Matthew 26. And look at verse 31. Matthew 26, 31. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended me because of me this night. For it is written, I'll smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. He said, I'll never be offended. He said, I'll die for you. And I believe Peter meant it. I believe Peter would have actually died for Jesus. But what happened? Look at verse 34. Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto you that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die for thee, yet will I never deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. Peter says, Look, Lord, look at, look at Matthew. Now Matthew will deny you. I know that. What about Thomas? Look at him. He looks like a guy that would deny you. Look at these disciples. They'll deny, Lord, I will never deny you. Folks, when you go to bragging, watch out. You go to bragging, watch out. When the soldiers came and arrested Jesus, Peter followed them as, as they took Jesus before the Sanhedrin. There they began to abuse him. They slapped him on the face. Folks, I'll tell you what, that'd be hard for a man to stand and let somebody slap him in the face. I don't know that I'm saved enough for that. I hope I am. Then they spit on him. Spit in his face. That'd take a man, folks, to stand there and let somebody spit in your face. When Peter saw this, he, he was thinking, oh, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know whether I can do this or not. Peter began to back up a little bit. He saw what was going on. He said, no, wait a minute here. 
Peter began then to deny Jesus. Look at verse 58. Verse 58. And Peter followed afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the service to see the end. He followed afar off and he was sitting with the servant. He should have been up there with his, with his Lord, shouldn't he? Then look at verse 69. Verse 69. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands. That's verse 67, 68. Saying, prophesy unto the Christ, who is this smote thee? Now verse 69. And Peter sat in the palace and a damsel came to him and said, Thou was also with Jesus of Galilee. He denied them all. Said, no, not me. I don't know that man. Look at verse 72. And again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. I swear I don't know who he is. Look at verse 73. And after a while came unto him and they stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also was with him. And they began, uh, for thy speech bereath thee. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. He began to curse and to swear. In verse 75, Peter remembers the words of, of Jesus and he went out and wept bitterly. Now listen, the words wept, the words wept bitterly mean to wail aloud. To sob, to be well. Peter had literally broken down. His heart was crushed within him, knowing that he had denied the Lord of glory. I've denied my Lord. And he broke down and he said, Oh God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it was too late. It already denied him. Peter repented of this vile, wretched sin. And on the day of Pentecost, he preached a sermon and 3,000 people come and were born again. Boy, wouldn't you like to have been there and seen that message when 3,000 people walked the aisle and claimed Christ as their own personal Savior. Peter learned from his mistakes, but too many people do not learn from their mistakes. They keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. But Peter learned. And from then on, he was a mighty disciple of his Lord. The fourth mistake. Now let's look at the fifth mistake. Look at Matthew 26 and verse 14. Matthew 26 and verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? and I'll deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Oh, folks, what, Peter, uh, what Judas did was horrible. Here was a man that traveled with Jesus for three years. He saw the miracles that Jesus did. He saw the miracles that Jesus did. He saw the miracle of him feeding 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. He saw the miracle of lepers being cleansed. He saw him raise the dead. He saw him walk on water. He saw him calm the storm by just saying, Peace, be still. And the raging sea was as calm as glass. He saw all these miracles. And Judas had all kinds of chances to be saved, but he rejected Jesus and sold our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. But look at Matthew 26 and verse 24. The Son of Man goeth as is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been. Boy, what a curse on Judas. Judas thought that his troubles was over with. So he, you know what he did? Look at verse 3, 27, chapter 27 and verse 3. Look what he did. Look what he did. 
And Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned in that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What's that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Judas thought his troubles was all over by hanging himself. Now he will know the consequences of his betrayal. Throughout eternity, Judas will try to wipe the innocent blood off of his hand, but there's no way that he can do it. That blood will stay there for all eternity. And the rope that Judas hung himself will become tighter and tighter and tighter. It will continually choke him and gag him as he breathes in the sulfuric gases of hell far. Judas will scream out, I betrayed innocent blood. He will never know a moment's rest from his betrayal of that innocent blood. There's an eternal consequences for sin and it's simply a price that you cannot afford to pay, neighbor. You cannot afford to pay the price of sin because it will really cost you. If you try to live without Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you forever and ever and ever. The Bible says that all liars... And sinners will be cast out into the lake of fire and brimstone and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now let me tell you, I think hell is like a county jail, what I think hell is. And I think the lake of fire is like the eternal prison because they'll take you out of that county jail and cast you into the lake of fire. And that's the great white throne judgment. And all sinners will stand at the great white throne judgment to be judged by Jesus Christ Himself. And they will be called forth to stand at that great white throne judgment. And all the saved of all the ages will stand as a witness at that time. And they will witness what will happen. And they will be, all the sinners will be called up. And Jesus will say, are their names written in the Lamb's book of life? And then the strong angel will look up and say, no, Lord, his name does not appear. And he'll say, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. There's an eternal consequences for sin. And neighbor, it is a price that you cannot afford to pay. You cannot afford that price of sin forever and ever. One day, one day that's going to be a reality. We just don't know when. Now, those that are in hell right now are not bound hand and foot. But when they're cast into the lake of fire, they will be bound hand and foot. There will be no freedom of movement whatsoever. And they'll be bogging up and down in the sulfuric acid of fire forever and ever. And they will scream out and blaspheme God forever and ever. There's no blaspheming of God in hell right now or what they're trying to do now. I can hear them calling out right now, Oh God, I repent! I want to be saved right now! Oh God, save me right now! But that call is falling on deaf ears. Because God will not listen to those condemned souls in hell forever and ever. Are you saved? Do you know for sure that you're saved? Folks, if you're not for sure, I don't mean, I think I am. If that's all you got, you don't have it. Well, I hope I am. Boy, if that's all you got, you surely don't have it. If you cannot say, I know without a shadow of a doubt, if I fell over dead right now, I would wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ. If you cannot say that, then you need to do something about it. And now's a good time to do it. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow never comes.
Tomorrow will never come. Today is tomorrow that we had yesterday. So tomorrow will never come. Are you saved? Make sure of it. Miss Dennis, we're going to give you an opportunity right now. I hope everybody here is saved. I, uh, as I look out, I think everybody here is saved maybe. But I trust, if you're not, that you would do something about it. Don't say, well, Jeff's not here. I can't do it. It don't matter on Jeff. Don't you wait on Jeff. Because you might not make it till Jeff gets back. You might fall over dead today. Think about it. You don't know when your time is. I don't know when my time is. It could be today. But I want to make sure that I'm ready. Are you? Amen. Let's all stand.